It's extraordinary the journey that he took. He was such a titan. A man of high moral character. A fine example of leadership. I don't think the Glen Swalls ever left the man. I am glad to breathe my native air again. My wife and I moved here in 1984 and rented this apartment. When we first moved in, I saw the plaque on the, on the front of the house and had no idea who Charles Evans Hughes was. You know, read his uh, resume out there and, uh, you know, it seemed impressive enough that I thought, well, how come I don't know who Charles Evans Hughes is? It seems like uh, he'd be somebody that you would know. Glens Falls was a village when Hughes was born here in a humble Baptist parsonage on April 11, 1862. Hughes moved from the neighborhood of his birth when he was five months old and from the greater Glens Falls area when he was around four. But he stayed in contact with the neighborhood throughout his distinguished career, which included serving as New York governor, running for president, serving as U.S. Secretary of State, and serving two stints on the Supreme Court. In 1908, Hughes, as governor, signed the charter to make Glens Falls a city. It has been my privilege to revisit Glens Falls many times since childhood days, and I have observed with pride and satisfaction the growth of the city and the civic spirit which has fostered the development. One of our native uh, sons is signing the charter that makes us a municipality, a city. And that's, that's quite an incredible thing if you think about it. Everything that was new, we, we as a city seem to just glom onto and say, we'll do it first. Um, we had electricity being generated here like in 1881, telephones being put in right around the same time. I mean, it doesn't seem like much today, but if it was new, if it was there, Glens Falls was doing it. Hughes was the son of the Reverend David Hughes, an abolitionist preacher who called slavery organized sin. No doubt the abolitionist fervor of the father influenced the son's devotion to civil rights. He was able to see the race issue in a way that he moved the agenda forward. He could see um, what a terrible thing racism was, particularly with his international perspective, as Secretary of State and the International Court, he knew, he knew that you can't be um, the home of the free and the home of slavery, segregation, and Jim Crow. He wrote in 1936, some uh, uh, black men had been convicted of murdering a white person. Their confessions were pretty much beat out of them. And, um, his uh, comment back then was the compulsion by torture to extort a confession is a different matter. I yeah, sit here in Warren County. He is um, our hometown boy, you know, and I know that from the stone at the uh, lawn on Crandall Library to the little house around the corner. And um, uh, it, it's a wonderful connection that he has. But he was speaking to us many, many decades ago about things that are still right under our nose. And that's intriguing to me. He, he basically took on all of the legal establishment and gradually over the course of his career got the Supreme Court completely turned around on civil rights from being hostile and unacceptable and unwilling to accept civil rights petitions to by the time he left it was basically 180 degrees where it was very receptive and that led to of course a series of decisions uh, after he left, including Brown v. Board of Education, where the, the, the courts and the judicial system completely changed its tune on civil rights. And he was a real hero on that issue. He doesn't get any credit. And I think that was a, a, an incredibly important part of, of his record as, as a public servant. My family's been here for years. My mother's from Hudson Falls, only five miles away. but. Uh, it's just a long history in the city and so you like knowing about what is our historical significance and how did people in our area actually get involved in government and history. Oh, I was so excited to learn that he was a champion of suffrage. He was running against Woodrow Wilson who was not 
and did not want to see women get the right to vote. He also had Huzettes, who is what he called his women, who came around with signs, you know, let women vote and all of that. They were his suffragettes. So I thought that was really something wonderful to learn about him. In 1906, Hughes made a campaign speech at Empire Theater on South Street in Glens Falls. He opened with a tribute to his birthplace. I am glad to breathe my native air again. Doesn't that say it all? Here he was saying, it's so good to breathe my native air. He loved Glens Falls, and uh, this was a very wealthy, a uh, bit self-satisfied, uh, and rightfully so, community that had uh, a theater that was considered to be, outside of New York, the most perfect acoustically. The Empire Theater in the Empire City, in the Empire State, and he's standing on the same stage as the Barrymores had, that Sarah Bernhardt had. He wasn't glorifying them, they weren't glorifying him. He was one monkey, equals, he was known, they were known. That's that's the power that was going on in Glens Falls then. In 1907, Hughes spoke at the Glens Falls Club about his push to establish the State Public Service Commission. As citizens, you are all interested in having the government well administered. On this question, there is no division along party lines. The people appreciate the importance of insisting upon efficiency and of improving the standards of administration. Those who oppose this just sentiment chant their own requiem. The menu included Little Neck Clams, Columbia River Salmon, Stuffed Rhode Island Turkey, French Peas in Irish Costume, and Cranberry Frappe. Hughes praised Glens Falls to reporters. Glens Falls is a pleasant place. It's a good place to be born in. That had been founded as a, as a club in I think it was about 1890, and Hughes was a charter member. They used to go up and have clam, uh, clam banks on uh, Lake George. All the prominent citizens who were went up. It, it solidified um, and maintained a link that Hughes always had with Glens Falls. It was a social hub. It's something that people forget that its presence near Lake George and the people who came from here and came back to here, came through here to go up to Lake George. This was a, a vital hub for a society that was producing people um, like Hughes. Also, you had the generation coming up with people such as the Hydes. The Hyde Collection building, the center of the, the three and the Renaissance Revival style, fairly simple. Italianate as a balustrade across the top, very simple facade, very elegant, sort of a country house look. Henry Wadsworth Bigelow, the architect who I think did all of their houses, uh, uh, was the, the designer of, of that and uh, was really um, uh, a remarkable achievement. When the uh, New York Times many years ago ran an article about the, uh, the Hyde collection, the importance of the collection and a little bit of the history, uh, they, I believe one of the opening sentences was how remarkable it was for a museum of this quality and of, of this caliber to be located so close to the source of funds that created it. They were coming back to Glens Falls, bringing back their wealth, bringing back their treasure, and beginning to create a society and a small city that was, that was important. It was important beyond just the area, and people forget that today. In 1908, it was a powerhouse. The combined families and the Hughes family became closer when the Hughes family lived temporarily on Warren Street in 1920 when Helen Hughes, the oldest Hughes daughter, was dying from tuberculosis. Elizabeth, while in Glens Falls, attended Glens Falls Academy with Polly Hoops, daughter of Morris. The two developed a friendship that would last the rest of their lives. Elizabeth would return to Warren Street in 1921 to spend the summer with the Hyde family while Mr. and Mrs. Hughes traveled in Europe. Political pundits were watching closely when New York Governor Charles Evans Hughes was among several potential presidential candidates 
attending the National Conference of Governors meeting at the White House in May 1908. Hughes chose not to stake out a stance on national issues, but instead to tout the history and continued preservation of New York's Adirondack Forest Preserve. The Empire State has been bountifully blessed by nature, and for a long period there has been a steady growth in the appreciation of her priceless treasures and of the importance of saving them. Land and water conservation were priorities for Hughes. The state added about 115,000 acres of land to the Adirondack Forest Preserve during the years Hughes was governor and added nearly 9,000 acres to the Catskill Forest Preserve. Our forests should be preserved and nurtured with scientific care. Our water powers should be developed for the suitable industry. It is of the most urgent necessity that our forests should be preserved from ruthless deforestation. He paid a lot of attention to the Adirondacks and the North Country. At that time, my understanding is even some of the mountains around Lake George were totally clear cut. He looked at that apparently and decided there's a better way to do things and the better stewardship would be, you know, for the growth of the forests and selective cutting and certainly uh, making sure that you don't have that kind of clear cutting again. He also knew the value of the wood and the forest for the, the lumbering, the timbering business. We wouldn't have had the paper mills that we have here if we didn't have all of that forest and all that timberland. Contemporary environmentalists might find reason to both praise and vilify Hughes, while local government officials and property rights advocates might say he took a balanced approach. Hughes forged a coalition between the Association for the Protection of the Adirondacks, an environmental organization, and the New York City Board of Trade and Transportation, a merchants group to advocate for preservation. He convinced the legislature to authorize the Forest Commission to pay a higher price per acre for land that was not already clear-cut. And he convinced the legislature to appropriate additional funds for reforestation. In 1908 alone, the state's nurseries raised 1.1 million pine and spruce trees to be replanted. The state's first paid forest rangers dedicated to the Adirondacks were assigned during the Hughes administration. Yet he proposed eliminating the so-called forever wild clause of the state constitution, prohibiting harvesting of timber on state forest preserved land. Hughes contended that if sustainable forestry practices were followed, the state over time could recoup the cost of purchasing land, making preservation more amenable to the general public. Hughes said the skepticism of environmentalists was understandable, based on past logging industry practice, but that an enlightened attitude was at hand. Hughes had more than an academic knowledge of the Adirondacks. He hiked, fished, camped, and vacationed there, particularly in the years he was governor. Just after his 1906 election victory, Hughes retreated with Republican Party leaders for a few days of rest and strategy sessions at Camp Kilcare near Raquette Lake in Hamilton County. The Adirondack Great Camp of Timothy Woodruff. Lady Tree Lodge at Saranac Inn became known as the Summer Governor's Mansion when Hughes and his family stayed there in the summers of 1908 and 1909. It was relaxing, but far from extended vacation time. The weeks were filled with meetings and travel around the state, interspersed with wilderness recreation back at the camp. Hughes had an outdoor guide on standby for hiking and fishing getaways. The Saranac Inn was the preeminent uh, hotel at the time, and anybody who was anybody came to this area. We are on the edge of the old Saranac Inn, and this house was um, obtained by the inn to use for special guests. When uh, Governor Hughes came, the view that you see today is identical to the view that he had 
when he came. Yeah, here's a map from 1902 um, of Upper Saranac Lake. Up here it says Saranac Inn, and where Hughes stayed was just above that where there's a cross. That cross also represents a natural artesian well, which is still used today. The water is as sweet and as pure as you can imagine. Um, and the view out across the whole lake here is of 20 plus Adirondack peaks, ranging from Whiteface to Ampersand, Seward, and many others in between. And the hotel had created this place called Deer Park, which was surrounded by fencing, and they stocked it with deer. There's a natural spring in there. So even to this day, the deer have never forgot, and this place is um, a haven for deer, wild turkey, fox, and we even have a bald eagle that soars around looking for fish all the time. So the Adirondacks today really owes a debt of gratitude to Governor Hughes. His time here, two years in a row, two summers, he ran the state of New York off the front porch of the, of, of the house here. He greeted all dignitaries and such there. He used the library inside the house for his office. Originally, the house was known as Lone Star Camp. Legend has it that Lady Tree Lodge got its name from this big pine tree behind me. Um, originally, the tree looked like a grand old lady with a head and a swooping down Victorian dress. You can see on the right, it got hit by lightning at one point, so I lost half the dress. But it is one of the oldest pine trees around. Some of the characteristics of these, of these grand homes would be the log siding, as well as what they call a screen, which is all that detailed latticework on the, on the end of the house. Um, today, we've had architectural historians come, and they've told us it's the largest intact existing screen in the Adirondacks. Well, we were fortunate enough to find this house for sale, and we are very excited about it. It needed a great deal of work we took it over, but luckily my wife is a historical preservation architect, so she embraced this project with open arms. It took us over two years to uh, restore it to its original grandeur. During that time, um, we applied f to the National Register of Historic Places. They were excited about it, and, and it's now on both the New York State as well as the uh, National Register. While we were renovating the house, we uncovered various things in it, and I honestly didn't know much about Charles Evan Hughes. And the more I read about him and heard about him, the more I was drawn into finding out more about this, this tower of, of a man. He, he did so many things in, in his life that really humbled me, and I just wish there were more people like him today. So he was known as a very approachable and accessible politician, and he would answer questions quite frankly. So they knew that the, the reporters would come over from the inn or from town at, at a regular time, and he would uh, meet with them regularly on the front porch, as well as, like I said, meeting various dignitaries. And the library in the house, they changed that into his office. And the dining room, they cleared out, and that's where all of his clerks um, worked. But he, um, he made a point of, he was very busy. He was, um, every day, he was taking care of the state's business, as well as, hunting and fishing and uh, just uh, spending time with his family. Yeah, this really was his base of operations and, and he really, um, I think it was influential um, for him, or it was, it's helpful for him to not only be running the state, but also to have a little bit of a retreat to be able to get that perspective on what is important and the best way to proceed forward. He was a very thoughtful man, would get up early, and I think he um, realized many ways to improve the state of New York. And, Many people who were influential would be at, at the inn also, so it kind of worked out well to meet with various people to, to get a lot of the state's business done. At Lady Tree in 1908, Hughes announced he would seek re-election as governor. Many had wanted him to run for president, but Hughes backed William Howard Taft. In July 1909, President Taft joined Hughes at Fort Ticonderoga, Plattsburgh, and Burlington, Vermont for celebrations of the 300th anniversary of Samuel de Champlain's visit to the region. Hughes said of Taft, Fellow citizens, the supreme moment 
of the exercises of this day has now arrived. I have the honor of introducing to you a great American man who honors his high office, the President of the United States. William Ferris Pell purchases the property in 1820. Uh, much of the fort had already fallen down or had been taken apart as more and more settlers came in needing building material. Why quarry stone when you can take whatever you want from the old fort? So literally parts of Fort Ticonderoga were carried off and exist in town and up and down the lake shore today as parts of buildings built in the late 17 and early 1800s. When uh, Governor Hughes and President Taft came to Fort Ticonderoga on July 6, 1909, the restoration of the fort had just begun a few months earlier. So one of the few things that was nearly complete was the officer's barracks or the west barracks, which is located behind me there, as well as sections of the southwest bastion, which is right behind me here. The restoration began on the officer's barracks because that was the most intact remains of the original parts of the fort. About half of that barracks building was still standing when reconstruction began in 1909. 1909 Tercentenary was an opportunity to both commemorate history and celebrate where the United States had come to from the times of its origin and the American Revolution. The weather on July 6, uh, 1909 probably couldn't have been worse from the point of view of having a large event with thousands of thousands of people here. It had rained hard the night before, rained hard that morning. The soil here is very clay-based, so it made it very slippery and muddy, and people joked that the size of their shoes got bigger throughout the day as the clay started clumping up and sticking to their shoes. It was so muddy inside the fort itself that they put down planks for the president to walk on so he didn't have to walk in the mud. The morning festivities started late because of the rain, and then the president was a little late getting here. So at this point where the president was supposed to be speaking, his train was still about 10 or 15 minutes south of Ticonderoga. So one of the newspaper reporters said that a single man started singing, My Country Tis of Thee. And he sang a few bars, and then he started to fade out when somebody else picked up the next line, and then somebody else, and next thing they knew, the entire crowd was singing the song and adding to some of the festivity. Pundits of the day said it was during this visit that Taft determined to offer Hughes a seat on the Supreme Court the next time there was an opening. Fact or fiction, Taft appointed Hughes to the Supreme Court the next year. It was supposed to be a season of rest as Charles took his first vacation since narrowly losing the 1916 presidential race. Relaxation turned to tension when Helen Hughes, oldest daughter of Charles and Antoinette, became ill while attending a Vassar College reunion at Silver Bay Association, where her father had spoken a decade earlier, and Helen was diagnosed to have tuberculosis. Helen Hughes, a young woman's Christian association worker, had previously become ill while tending to patients at a Boston hospital during the Spanish influenza epidemic in the fall of 1918. The illness left her susceptible to pneumonia. Helen stayed the rest of the summer with Charles and Antoinette at their rented Lake George cottage. In the fall, the Hughes family rented a home at 71 Warren Street in Glens Falls, up the street from where the Hyde Collection is located now, and around the corner from the home where Charles was born. Charles spent weekdays in New York City working at his law firm, and took the train to Glens Falls to join the family on weekends. Concern weighed heavily on him. Son, Charles Evans Hughes Jr., said it was the first time he saw his father cry. Helen died at 3.55 a.m. Sunday, April 18, 1920, 28 years, three months, and seven days old. Dedicating her life to good works, she realized my ideal of a good character, and her passing in the fullness of her young womanhood, a victim of dedicated service, seemed to me the saddest of life's ironies. It left a wound that has never healed. 
Vassar alumni determined a memorial chapel at Silver Bay, where Helen had fallen ill, would be a fitting tribute. Antoinette laid the cornerstone on June 19, 1921, and Charles and Antoinette both attended the dedication. The chapel has certainly been a, um, such an important dimension of, of Silver Bay and its heritage and its history. And so many people love to come and just sit quietly in the chapel. The number of weddings we've done here, the number, number of memorial services, the number of internment services, our Sunday worship service, we have a Vesper service every night in the summer. of Helen Hughes and what she did as a young person is certainly alive today so much in the community that we now have at Silver Bay and especially around this chapel. This memorial garden that's next to the chapel that we're actually sitting in uh, we, we created about 15 years ago because many Silver Bay families um, this is their home, a spiritual home and so they were quietly putting ashes of loved ones around the campus because um, that's where they wanted their loved ones to be laid to rest. So we applied to the state of New York and were uh, granted a permit for a cemetery. And uh, now there are hundreds of ashes from loved ones uh, in our garden here. And uh, many, many hundreds of people have said this is where they'd like to be uh, laid to rest. So the chapel and the memorial garden, which beautiful setting, very much connected. It's certainly a centerpiece for, for Silver Bay and is so symbolic of um, what we're about. Certainly Helen Hughes, her humanitarian work, um, her, her care of others, her compassion that way, continues on through this chapel and through these, this memorial garden. On board the Mohican for a cruise of Lake George, one of the points of interest is Cannon Point where Charles Evans Hughes and his wife vacationed in 1925. It was one of about a half dozen years that Charles and Antoinette vacationed at Lake George for all or part of the summer, dating back to 1888 when they honeymooned at Lake George. In a speech to the Lake George Association in August 1933, Hughes said that he had developed a good habit, that of returning to Lake George in summer. I am always impressed with the beauty of this scene. When we have a scene of this sort, it ought to be preserved as a great spiritual resource. Many points of interest on the Lake George Steamboat Company vessel cruise are associated with Hughes. There's the Sagamore Resort on the 70-acre Green Island at Bolton Landing, where Charles and Antoinette vacationed in 1933. Hughes, in his college years, spent two weeks each summer at a Delta Upsilon fraternity camp on an island in the vicinity of the Sagamore. Hughes, in his autobiographical notes, wrote fondly about the DU camp. In the evening, we would sing our college songs, and the patrons of the nearby inns formed an appreciative audience as they clustered about our island in their boats. There's the one-time summer homes of business associates, George Foster Peabody and Spencer Trask, who made news in the New York Times when they transported Hughes on August 27, 1909, when he spoke on Governor's Day at Silver Bay Association, a YMCA conference center at Hague. Hughes gave a non-political speech titled, The Century's Opportunities. Peabody transported Hughes from Lake George Village north to Silver Bay on his yacht Pocahontas, and Trask transported Hughes back to the village afterward on his yacht Arrow. Hughes, in 1909, at the behest of Trask and others, pushed through legislation for the state to purchase land around Mineral Springs in Saratoga Springs, Governor Spring in High Rock Park, was named in Hughes's honor. The New York Sun dubbed the legislation 
the Saratoga Salvation Act. There's the Lake George Club, where Chinese cuisine was served at the July 4, 1919 dinner when Hughes was keynote speaker. Hughes reflected on his birth in Glens Falls and his visits to Lake George as a child and young man. It seems almost like returning to a first love. The happiest days of my youth were spent on these waters, and to return here is not to come as a stranger, but like returning to an old home. I was just amazed when I read about him and what he'd accomplished and it, that he'd been born in little old Glen Falls. And he had very, uh, very big goals for our country and the world. And he was even very influential in giving a plug for the United Nations and different organizations. So, I mean, he really uh, was very outstanding in many ways. Hughes once again was in contact with Glens Falls when he retired from the Supreme Court in June 1941. Morris Hupps of the Hyde Collection Combined Families wrote to Hughes, Like everyone else, we had thought of you as the one rock to which the country was safely anchored, and we feel a great sense of loss of security now that you are to retire. Hughes wrote back, we trust that we shall see you and the other members of your combined families whenever you or any of them come to Washington. Mrs. Hughes and I warmly cherish your friendship. Hughes died August 27, 1948 in Massachusetts. He is buried at Woodlawn Cemetery in the Bronx. Hughes' family connections with Glens Falls would continue on October 16, 1962, the Hughes Memorial in Glens Falls City Park was dedicated, the same year the U.S. Post Office issued a four-cent stamp honoring Hughes. In 1971, John J. Cunningham, chairman of the Hyde Collection Board, came across in a New York City art shop a portrait long thought to be lost that Hungarian artist Philip Alexis de Lazio painted of Hughes. Cunningham contacted the Hughes family, who donated the painting to hang in what, at the time, was a new wing of Crandall Public Library. You know, we're open to the public, that's why we're here. Besides those little collections I, I mentioned, we. Uh, Maury and I collaborated on a, an exhibit a couple of years ago, and in the course of that, uh, we acquired a lot of materials about Hughes. So there is a, a Charles Evans Hughes collection. The library back in the late 60s, um, early 70s, uh, decided to do an addition. They had outgrown the space, and they put on a, what we call the 1970s edition. In the meantime, this portrait was found down in New York and the family was notified, um, good friends of the Hydes, you know, Elizabeth, uh, his younger daughter, uh, was gotten in touch with and they decided as an opening of the new wing they were going to donate this portrait to the library. For the dedication and when this was unveiled, uh, the Gossets came. William was a prominent lawyer, they came out from Michigan. You know, they were good friends with the, the Hydes. Um, and so they came out for the dedication. Um, I, my understanding of it was that they did it out in the gazebo. Uh, it was a you know, it was a relatively nice day in May. I think it was May 24th or something. And, you know, big newspaper coverage and, uh, you know, a ribbon cutting and an unveiling. And then um, uh, Mr. Gossett did a long speech. We actually have a, a transcript of the speech. He kind of set the legacy of Hughes. He, you know, he, that was his father-in-law, so he, he really, and he worked in his firm, so he gave a whole lot of background about Charles Evans Hughes. The, the criticism most frequently heard of Hughes as an individual was that he had a cold and austere personality, that he was a man who was devoted to his profession with little time or inclination for human relationships. My response to that, those who made that assessment simply did not know the man. It is true that he was devoted to his profession, and when there was work to be done, he believed in complete involvement in it. And when the work was done, he enjoyed a well-earned respite, and 
had an admirably developed lighter side. He loved good stories and enjoyed telling them. Indeed, he liked conversation. Surprisingly, he had a highly talented mimic, and in the privacy of a family gathering, he was known to mimic with great skill some of the contemporary public figures, Calvin Coolidge and Will Rogers among them. On June 2nd, 1976, Elizabeth Hughes Gossett and Polly Hoops Beeman participated in a ceremony to dedicate a new plaque on the historic birthplace of Charles Evans Hughes. Elizabeth, when she died, left two artworks in her will to Polly, a lasting connection that remains at the Hyde Collection. Well, there's nothing like having a bra in your collection. This is a print by the artist Georges Bra, dates from 1958, uh, and is called Oiseau en Forêt, or Birds in the Forest. I think most people will know Brock as a contemporary and friend of Pablo Picasso, and the two together in the 19-teens created the movement Cubism. And with that in mind, this will look very odd. Cubism is about the fracturing of the object, the sort of angular breaking down of form and representing the movement of the object, the movement of the viewer um, through and the passage of time all on a flat surface. In some ways, Brock is playing with the same ideas. So this is a pen and ink with a slight wash, drawing by Isabel Bishop, well known for her drawings and renderings of small individuals or small groups, couples as you see here. And we know that this was owned by Elizabeth Hughes and uh, according to her will was presented to Polly Hoops at her death and then passed on to the collection here at the Hyde. Well, it has two valuable things for us. Um, firstly, there's the family connection, that it was an item that was uh, bequeathed to Polly Hoops. And so we, we the, the very core of this museum is the collection of Charlotte and Louis Hyde with additional pieces from the Hoops and the Cunningham families. Um, so it's important in that way to us. Uh, it ties the Hyde into um, another important regional family, the Hugheses. And then again, here we have a, um, an example of a woman artist, quite successful, um, and that is uh, an area in which we would like to, to build the collection even more. There's a wonderful social history that comes in understanding the life of a woman artist of the late 19th and first half of the 20th century, because you have to understand her background, how she was able to, to be trained, to have an education, and then how she had to struggle to get representation commissions and galleries that would present her. So that tells us, it, it opens up a whole sort of social world that is both local in Glens Falls and is national in the life of a female artist of the 20th century. The more I looked into him, I realized what a world-class figure he was and what a, a brilliant intellect he had. And he was a man of integrity. He was the type of person that we all would like to see in, uh, in our elected officials. He uh, taketh away and he giveth most appropriate for the son of a Baptist minister. <laughs> yeah, I think Charles Evan Hughes is a very significant person in our history, and I think um, not enough people know about who he is and what he had accomplished and how we should all be thankful to having individuals like that and how he should be set up as an example of others to follow because he did so many different things in his life, and any one of those would be enough for most people to, to, to call uh, a significant career.
He was a phenomenal intellect, but he had a, a very, a very gregarious personality. He was a very outgoing guy, which was contrary to his image, probably, probably significantly in part because of his beard. A lot of social legislation took place under him in New York State. Really important social legislation. He was the most apolitical politician I've ever heard of. He was um, considered by almost all the justices to be one of the greatest chief justices of all times. Man. 